All right, open your Bibles with me, please, to Matthew chapter 10. I'm only going to be reading a couple of verses in this chapter. Matthew chapter 10. We'll start reading in verse 34. Matthew 10, verse 34. Jesus speaking. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. And that last phrase is the focus of this message. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. And that includes the household of faith. As surely as William Barrett Travis drew a line in the sand at the Alamo, a line is being drawn in the hearts of men today. By the time it's over, every man and every woman in America will have to choose which side of the line they are on. Neutrality will not be an option. Furthermore, the line is separating not only political and cultural adversaries, it is dividing friends and families as well. In fact, it is no hyperbole to say that the enemy is not only at the gates, the enemy is within the gates. Then again, I suppose that during any momentous turning point of history, it has always been this way. And make no mistake about it, we are at the precipice of a momentous turning point of history. The enemy has always done its best and most effective work from within. At this point, I'm reminded of what America's most celebrated jurist, Daniel Webster, said. Quoting Webster, There is no nation on earth powerful enough to accomplish our overthrow. Did you hear that? He told the truth. There is no nation on earth powerful enough to accomplish our overthrow. Our destruction, should it come at all, will be from another quarter, from the inattention of the people to the concerns of their government, from their carelessness and negligence. I must confess that I do apprehend some danger, still quoting. I fear that they may place too implicit a confidence in their public servants and fail properly to scrutinize their conduct. That in this way, they may be made the dupes of designing men and become the instruments of their own undoing. And that's exactly what's happening in America today. And if America does eventually collapse, this will be the reason why. And the media, which is supposed to be the vanguard of freedom in protecting the knowledge of the American people and how they are kept aware 
of the tyrannical tendencies of their government has now become nothing more than a propaganda machine for big government. Which means you are not going to be told the shenanigans that are going on in your houses of government by the media. Which means you must do the work yourself. And thankfully, we have the ability to circumvent the media and information is available if we are willing to do the work to find it. At this point in history, any American citizen who is ignorant of the foibles that are happening inside the hallowed halls of Congress, be it state or federal, is willingly ignorant. Because if we want to find the truth, the truth is out there to be found. So go find it. Find out what your government is doing. Find out what your senators, your congressmen, your state legislators are doing. Because knowledge, as someone said, is power. And the more you know, the more you are able to act upon that knowledge and influence others who are yet in the dark. So Daniel Webster's fear is as germane today as it was the day that he spoke it. Therefore, our greatest threat does not come from Iraq, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Russia, China, etc. Our greatest threat is within the gates of our own country. Our greatest threat is the designing men in our own government. That is our greatest threat. I will even go further than that. Many times, our greatest threat is within the doors of our own churches. Remember the Lord Jesus was betrayed by one of his own apostles. King David was betrayed by his own son. Samson was betrayed by a lover. Noah was betrayed by his own grandson. Joseph was betrayed by his own brothers. Moses was betrayed by the ten trusted scouts. The list goes on and on. I will remind you that during our war for independence, the colonial army had far more to fear from Benedict Arnold than it did from King George. And so it is today. The enemy at the gates at least looks like the enemy. It dresses like the enemy. It talks like the enemy. It acts like the enemy. But the enemy within the gates looks like a friend, dresses like a friend, talks like a friend, acts like a friend but it's still the enemy. The enemies of freedom are ubiquitous today. They are in Washington, D.C., our state legislatures and county commissions. They sit on the benches of our judiciaries. They teach in our colleges and universities. They preach in our pulpits. They teach in our Sunday school classrooms. These enemies of whom I speak are those who would rather protect and defend illegitimate, unlawful, and oppressive government than protect and defend freedom. They would rather please the powers that be than please the power that is.
and they would rather promote their own success and prosperity than the success and prosperity of their country. They are self-aggrandizing statists who suck at the teat of big government. They might be Democrats or Republicans. At the national level, both have a large welfare-addicted constituency. They might be Christians or unbelievers. In fact, many of today's Christians, churches, and pastors are proving themselves to be the enemies of freedom. For the last several years, the absence of Christians, and especially pastors, from the freedom fight is glaring. The vast majority of them show little interest in whether or not their state defends itself from ever-increasing federal encroachments. By the way, Cascade County Sheriff Jesse Slaughter, I wrote about him in my column this week that syndicates all over the country. If you read my column, you know where I'm going. Cascade County, Montana Sheriff Jesse Slaughter is a hero Amen. for all American. So what happened was the ATF collaborated with the Canadian police and brought Canadian law enforcement into the state of Montana to the county of Cascade. And together with the ATF, were spying on Montana citizens at a gun show in Cascade County. Canadian foreign police agencies spying on American citizens with the assistance of our ATF. Of course, the sheriff was not notified of this encroachment. But good citizens at the gun show saw somebody out in the parking lot taking photographs of automobile license plates and people coming and going not knowing who they are and what was going on, they called the sheriff's office. Amen. Sheriff Slaughter somehow realized that he needed to be there. He went and he found out what was going on. He pulled the agents from the ATF and Canada aside and told them in no uncertain terms, to leave the property stat. Amen. Which they did. The sheriff primary responsibility is to do exactly what Sheriff Slaughter did this week, is to protect the liberties of the people of his county. And that's exactly what that good sheriff did. Interrupted my own paragraph. They show little attention, I'm talking about Christians and pastors, to the exponential growth of a fascist style police state that is taking shape in front of their very eyes. And they seem little concerned over the demise of constitutional government. Beyond that, I have discovered firsthand that not only do many Christians seem to revel in apathy and indifference to the aforementioned attacks against our liberties, they will often unleash vehement resistance and hatred to the brother that stands in opposition to these attacks. No wonder Jesus said, a man's foes shall be those of his own household. Some of these enemies and false brethren are motivated by jealousy. 
Some are motivated by greed or ambition. Still others suffer from extreme character deficiencies, such as egomania, pride, laziness, cowardice, or intense feelings of insecurity. Regardless of the motivation, they set their sights and wet their arrows against those who would dare take a bold and courageous stand for liberty. My fellow patriots, watch your back because your greatest enemy is probably behind you. Remember, Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. John chapter 1 verse 11. And the antitype in Zechariah chapter 13 verse 6, it is said, quote, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Close quote. I too carry the wounds I have received in the house of my friends. Perhaps the patriot's courage convicts the status of his own cowardice or greed. Perhaps the status truly despises liberty in his own heart because in his soul he himself is a tyrant or a slave. When the discussion of liberty is broached in today's churchianity, I fear this is a major part of the problem. As I've told you before, you will be shocked to know how many pastors in our evangelical churches today are monarchists in their heart. I've said this before to you, I'll say it again. If you're attending a church, you should ask your pastor this question. Were America's founding fathers biblically justified when they fought the war of independence from Great Britain? And if it takes him longer than 1.3 seconds to say yes, you're in the wrong church. These pastors will not come out and tell the truth of what they really believe because it would be very unpopular. But in their hearts, they are monarchists. And I know many of them by the dozens and scores personally. They personally believe in the old antiquated divine right of kings doctrine. They truly believe that our founding fathers rebelled against God and sinned and that America was brought into existence unjustly. These men are among the most hypocritical of all human beings on planet Earth. Every Independence Day, they wave the American flag. They bring in patriotic speakers. They'll bring in maybe legislators or congressmen or other people in public service. And they will talk about the greatness of America and they'll talk about the freedom of America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yet in their hearts, they believe that America was conceived in spiritual adultery. In their hearts, they believe that our founding fathers were rebels, rebels not just against King George, but against King Jesus. In their hearts, they despise America from the very way that it was formed. And yet, they pretend on these holidays to be patriotic Americans. They're hypocrites. They're pretenders. That's why during the course of 12 months, they will do nothing to alert their congregations to what's happening in their country. Not only because 
they don't want to offend the IRS or because they don't want to offend somebody in the audience, but because they in their hearts do not believe in America. They do not believe in the Declaration of Independence. They do not believe in our Constitution. They do not believe in our Bill of Rights. They are monarchists, which means they're tyrants at heart. And that's why they pretend to be patriotic on these holidays, but the rest of the year you'll hear them say nothing, or if they make any reference what's in, in, in passing, it'll usually be a negative. Well, we know that all the founders weren't perfect. Duh. <laughs> Are all the preachers perfect? Are you perfect, preacher? That's just a sly way of cutting down the reputation of our founding fathers. Hush up! You don't bear a candle compared to the light of freedom shown by our founding fathers. You monarchist, tyrannical hypocrite. Get out of the pulpit. You're not God's man. You're the man of tyranny. You're the man of deception. Your day will come and can't come too soon. And I'm telling you, all across America, these men are behind the pulpits. And people don't even realize what these men believe and what these men feel in their hearts. I can tell you, I have witnessed firsthand the effects that legalism, denominationalism, and corporatism have caused within the church. Many Christians are so enslaved by legalistic churches and institutions that they wouldn't know freedom if it came up and bit them on their blessed assurance. They are told what kind of music to listen to how to wear their hair, what color shirts to wear, even how husbands and wives should express their love to each other. Their entire lives are lived as subjects and servants to the all-powerful institution, read denomination, church, school, college, etc. What, pray tell, does the subject of liberty mean to them? They're already enslaved. Likewise, many professing pastors are as enslaved to a denomination or to a church board or committee as any political subject in any oppressed country. To them, there's no truth worth defending but the truth proclaimed by the almighty denomination. There's no battle worth fighting unless it is sanctioned by the all-wise church board. And there's no enemy worth resisting who is not identified by the all-knowing committee. What, pray tell, does the subject of liberty mean to them? Are they not slaves already? How can we expect people who are religiously enslaved to be lovers of civil liberty? They don't even know what liberty is. They live in bondage every day of their lives. What difference does it make who the tyrant is? If you live in bondage, you're in bondage. The tyrant is immaterial. Trade one tyrant for another, it doesn't matter, you're still a slave. These men are slaves to their boards and their committees and their denominations and their, their governing hierarchies and all these religious institutions that monopolize not just their actions but their thoughts and their hearts to the point that they are servants of men. The Apostle Paul said that we must not be the servants of men but the servants of God. You cannot be the servants of men and the servants of God at the same time. 
Then there's the corporate slave. This is the so-called Christian status who recognizes no church that the IRS does not recognize or approve. This is the Christian who, if he lived in communist China, would attend the state-approved church with a state-approved minister preaching state-approved sermons to state-enslaved subjects. But almost everyone knows the real church in oppressed countries, such as China, is never the one you see in state-sponsored, we have freedom of religion here, propaganda photo ops. The real church in oppressed countries meets in private living rooms, back rooms, barns, sheds, or even the backwoods. In all likelihood, their gatherings are illegal, their ministers unlicensed, their worship politically incorrect. This has been the history of the real church since the book of Acts. And it's fast becoming the experience of the real church in America. Yes, there is a line being drawn in the sand in this country. One will either be a statist who is devoted to the supremacy of the state, or he or she will be a freedomist who is devoted to the spirit and principles of liberty. And just like a Travis at the Alamo, there can be no neutrality. And my beloved, I personally believe that God himself is drawing this line in the sand. I believe this is of God. I also believe that many professing Christians are quickly lining up on the wrong side of that line and have made themselves the enemies of truth and freedom and those who love them. I also believe that God is preparing a robust and righteous remnant from among those who love liberty and are willing to guard and defend it, while the traditional church is being given over to servitude and judgment. The church in America today is under judgment. Mainstream churchianity is collapsing. There are more churches for the first time ever in the history of our country. There are more churches closing than there are starting in America. Church membership overall is drastically reduced and going down every year even further. More and more people in America are considering themselves to be agnostic, atheist, or none of the above. People who call themselves Christians have held steady at the 90% mark and above since the founding of America. Think about it. In the 200 plus years of our country's history, over 90% of the people of this country claimed to identify themselves as Christians. Just within the last few years and sets, in fact, since the beginning of the 21st century, that number has decreased from 90 plus percent down to barely over 60 percent. In 20 years, we have gone from 90 percent, which it was for over 200 years, down to just above 60%. And the pollsters that are doing these surveys are telling us it's only going to be a couple of decades or so, and there will be more non-Christians by identity, more non-Christians in America than Christians. That is a collapse, my friend. That's not just a downturn. That is a collapse of the establishment 
church in America. And I submit that's not all bad. These churches have been playing God, have been playing religion. It's been all about self-help motivational speaking. It's all about popularity. It's all about money. It's all about greed. It's all about making people feel good, giving people a, a, a high. It's all about smoke and mirrors and music and dancing and all this stuff that you can find anywhere else outside of church. It's been playing God, playing religion for at least 50 years in this country. And I think God is saying to America, I'm tired of your games. And they're collapsing. But out of that collapse, out of the rubble, are coming the Liberty Fellowship type of remnant people like are watching right now across America and the world who love truth and who are willing to follow truth and they're fed up with the phony religion that they find downtown at the high steeple church and they want reality and they want truth and that I believe that crowd that remnant of truth lovers is growing right now under the nose of Satan and are going to spit in his eye and tell him this country does not belong to you. It does not belong to your imps in government. We the people who love God and love freedom are still alive and well in America. And they didn't get that at church. They got that in here. Amen. They got that by the Holy Spirit speaking directly to their heart, just like he did to mine, and like he did to yours, and like he did to yours online. This is a work of God. I also believe, well, I just said that. So I still believe it. This is why I keep saying that this fight is spiritual, not political. From our statement of faith, I just thought that this message would be appropriate to bring this to the audience. If you go online, libertyfellowshipmt.com, you can, you can find our statement of faith, the, the whole thing. But let me just read you some excerpts. We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, not just a young woman. If your translation says young woman, there's a garbage can over there, dump it in on the way out. Boy, that'd be a real sign from the prophet, wouldn't, wouldn't it be? Here the sign shall be unto you. A young woman shall bear a child. That's what these perverse translations say. And a lot of preachers are preaching from those perverse translations. And church members are reading from those perverse. No, it, what the sign wasn't a young woman shall conceive. The sign was a virgin shall conceive. We believe that he lived a sinless life, which means he fulfilled the righteousness for us. He died a substitutionary, vicarious death on the cross for our sins. He rose physically, bodily from the grave. That his death and resurrection completely fulfilled and abolished the old covenant. That he ascended to the Father, where he sits on the throne of power and authority, ruling over his spiritual kingdom, the church. That he's coming again to abolish all of the forces of evil and establish the eternal home for the saints in the new Jerusalem. 
that salvation is by grace through faith, minus and plus nothing. We vehemently reject work salvation, i.e. water baptism, sign gifts, church membership, keeping the Old Testament law, obeying the golden rule as a means of obtaining or keeping salvation. We stand for, promote, and defend the biblical natural law principles of individual liberty, state sovereignty, and lawful jurisdiction. We oppose socialism, neoconism, and Zionism. Accordingly, we do not support the socialistic welfare state or the neocon warfare state. Neither do we believe that the modern Zionist state of Israel represents either historical biblical Israel or prophetic Israel. Accordingly, we reject Schofieldism and dispensational futurism. If you're watching the prophecy series I'm currently going through, you're beginning to get that idea, I think. We stand for the biblical natural law principles that govern every individual state and nation, including the natural law principles of religious and individual liberty, the freedom of worship without state interference, and the right of self-defense. Therefore, we adamantly support the first, second, and fourth amendments to our U.S. Constitution, along with the rest of our Bill of Rights. We preach and teach so as to apply the principles of God's Word to everyday life, including our political life. Therefore, we will not be coerced, intimidated, or bribed into preaching politically correct messages or avoid political issues affecting our liberties. Here we stand. It has been a long, long time since I have quoted from Shakespeare's Henry V the St. Christmas Day speech. But I'm going to do it here. Amen. One of my favorites. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it, shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. This day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves a curse they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap whiles any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. And I say, Christians in America, now abed, shall think themselves accursed, they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks that fought with us at liberty's side today. Let's stand for a word of prayer.